Okay, as I said, week number 96 in our series from the Beloved, and uh, we are in John 17. Now, we started John 17 last week. We got exactly one verse through it, uh, but that was because we were doing some setup work, and, and before we get into the actual content of John 17, I want to go back and talk about some big picture themes that we have um, that we have kind of explored throughout our series in John's Gospel. And the first is this concept of the presentation of Jesus' identity in John's Gospel. I think John's Gospel does a, a, a very thorough and multifaceted job of trying to tell us who, who Jesus is. He employs a lot of different strategies. Okay. I found this on the web for Sarah, in multifaceted job of trying to tell us who who Jesus is. Check it out. Did I say Siri there? Did I? Okay, so here, this was like the Wizard of Oz situation. It was weird. I was wondering if it was popping up there, too. So... <laughs> So on the video, I'm going to have to cut all that out because I'm, I'm guaranteed that was much louder on video than it will be here. And it was pretty loud here. So how has John, uh, what sort of ways has John used to describe Jesus to the readers? What are some things that we've seen? He's the light of the world. Okay, what else? Lamb of God. What else? Good shepherd. Okay, and I want to stop right there. Those are three very good high examples. What kind of, of sentence would we, or, or kind of statement would we call that? We'd call that a metaphorical statement. We call that a metaphor. Because is Jesus actually a little white, you know, mammal with fluffy fur? No. So it's not, it's not literally the lamb, right? He's metaphorically the lamb. Now, why is that, that, that image so important? Because it ties us back to the Old Testament actual lambs of the Passover feast and of the sacrificial system. So the metaphor is used to tie us to something deeper, light of the world. Is Jesus actually a physical ball of gas that emanates light from within himself? No, he's an incarnate, he's incarnate uh, human being, got flesh and blood, but in a way, again, ties back to all this, uh, this really uh, profound imagery of the majesty of God ties us back to the creation scenario in which, which God says, let there be light, and there was light. So you get all this kind of imagery in there. Good shepherd, is Jesus literally out there in a field with sheep and a crook actually shepherding these mammals across a field? No, but in a way, he does that sort of work for us. Okay, so that's one way. That's probably the most obvious way that John uses to describe uh, the identity of Jesus. What other ways have we seen? Now, some of, uh, some of it is kind of married with the, the metaphorical statements, but we also see something about who Jesus is in his teaching. Now, some of his teaching is metaphorical, but some of it is very direct. When he's talking about his relationship to the Father, those are obviously very direct statements. Very direct statements. You guys can come on forward. We're not... You're not going to interrupt. That's fine. Uh, very direct statements, right? When he's talking about those, those kind of interactions and those, those plays, those, that teaching is very uh, profound about uh, kind of describing who he is. What are some other ways we understand about uh, Jesus' identity, who he is? He's the Savior, okay? We get that in his teaching. We get that in his mission, one of the other ways that we see how, who Jesus is, is in his, how he chooses to interact with various groups of people. What are some of the groups of people that he interacts with? Okay, so Gentiles, Samaritans specifically. We have one really specific example that, that creates another uh, set of interactions with the larger group of Samaritans, and that's in John chapter 4, the Samaritan woman at the well. And there's a lot to unpack with that. Uh, she's not a Gentile. She's worse than a Gentile, okay, as far as the, the, the author's describing it. Uh, what are some other groups? The Pharisees and Sadducees, the religious leaders. 
We have one specific example that's highlighted. That's Nicodemus in John chapter 3. And I don't, it's not an accident that John 3 and John 4 show Jesus interacting with two very different uh, types of people and, and from very different sh- uh, classes and strata according to the religious, the Jewish religious kind of uh, hierarchy and pecking order. What other groups? The, the actual disciples, the apostles. And, and, and in the farewell discourse, we've seen this long uh, teaching where Jesus is directly addressing his closest followers. Okay, so that's the, the major groups. You could go through and find other uh, kind of categories of that. Um, we've heard Jesus describe his relationship in terms of his mission. What did he come to this earth to do? We have seen how that I, the identity of Jesus, because of his mission, is then transferred to those who follow him. The language of abiding that we've seen pop up throughout John's gospel is meant to show us not just the communion that Jesus' followers have with him, but what that communion leads to. And what does it lead to? It doesn't lead to being a good church person. It leads to a life of mission. Now, that does not mean you necessarily pack up and you move to some foreign country, but it means that your life, wherever you are called, is to be on mission, on the mission of Jesus Christ, exhibiting who Jesus is and what he's done for the whole world. That's a big chunk of the farewell discourse, John 13 through 16, big chunk of it is how Jesus' mission is transferred to the mission of those who follow him. So we talked about this, and I meant to have this up on the screen. I'm sorry about this. You're just going to have to listen and take really detailed notes if you want to hear this, okay? Several weeks ago, and I'm talking probably at this point 21 weeks ago, uh, I gave a definition about the identity of Jesus uh, as it's presented in John's gospel, and I've added to it based on the farewell discourse. So here it is. This is how John presents the identity of Jesus. Jesus, as the Son of God, is both God and man, and was sent as the King, conquering the brokenness of this world and bringing redemption and wholeness to his sacrificial service. He came to be with his people, and he is the fulfillment of the entire Old Covenant in prophecy, law, poetry, and prose. Everything that is stated in the Old Covenant promises is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Uh, I'll have that again next week so that you can have it down if you'd like to to write that down. I have used that definition before. Now, when we get to John 17, what we get is the interaction between Jesus, Son of God, and Father, first person of the Trinity. Now, last week, we asked the question, how how do we describe this final prayer in John 17? Some people have the title uh, in John 17, the high priestly prayer. Some people have the title, uh, Jesus prays for himself. Some people have the title, Jesus prays for his followers. Some people have a combination of all three of those or four of those things. And uh, we came to the determination that there is uh, how many right answers? All of them. Because none of them are scripture. They're simply a a describe or descriptive of, what the, of the content of that which is Scripture. I tend to land on the high priestly prayer as my kind of, you know, the lens through which I read John 17. And, and there's a couple different reasons. Some people will read John 17 and say, you can't call it a high priestly prayer because Jesus also prays for himself. When he's praying for his followers, that, that of course, is the high priestly portion. When he's praying for himself, that's not. Except, what is the high priest supposed to do in the Old Testament? Prepare and present sacrifices. What is Jesus getting ready to do? Be the sacrifice. We said it last week. Jesus is both priest and sacrifice. He's the only person who could fulfill that. And so when he's praying for himself, he is preparing the sacrifice. He's preparing himself. In as much as the farewell discourse in John 13 through 17 is a preparation of the disciples, for, for when Jesus departs, returns, and then departs again. John 17 is a preparation for Jesus as he heads to the cross. So I kind of land on the fact that this is still the high priestly prayer. But it doesn't matter if you disagree with me because it's not scripture anyway. It's just a way 
to understand uh, the content. There's an element in John 17 of summarizing the totality of John's narrative about Jesus' ministry. And it's also, we said last week, we used the, the musical term, it's a crescendo to the climax of Jesus' ministry in the cross and empty tomb. We briefly talked about the opening words of John 17. It says in verse 1, when Jesus had spoke, spoken these words, that means the farewell discourse, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. And we stopped right there. We said, what is the hour? The hour is this moment that Jesus has been building towards. And the hour has, has demonstrated, the, the imminence of the hour has been presented since John chapter 12. Do you remember what happened in John chapter 12 that was so significant? Where Jesus change it, changes from the hour is yet to come or has not come to the hour is 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 imminent it has come what what changed okay that is true it prompted something else to happen though the same chapter prompted something else to happen when he says the hour has come it's another group of people another group of people seek jesus who are they i think it's verse 35 Sorry, no, 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 not 35, 23. There you go, the Greeks. Now, why is that significant? The Greeks seek Jesus. Why is that significant? Because they are, there you go, they're Gentiles. And something has changed. That, that's a monumental shift. They're not seeking, now why are they even in Jerusalem in the first place? Because they are either a proselytes to Judaism from the Greek uh, people, or they are simply uh, kind of philosophy fans, uh, fanatics of philosophy that are going to the next religious kind of convention. That's what they thought of as the Passover in some uh, Greek philosophical circles. And they hear about this Jesus and they go to Philip, who has the, one of the most Greek names in the amongst the disciples and say, can we see Jesus? And then Jesus doesn't respond. He says, now the hour has come. Now the hour has come. And that starts the march to the cross. Um, up to that point, it's been the hour is yet to come or the hour will come or my time, my time has not yet come. So this hour is not really a single hour, but it's a, an hour that's wrapped in a series of hours when Jesus will march towards this experience of the depth of humiliation and the height of exaltation. Yes, Nancy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there we go. So what Nancy just said, if you couldn't hear, is wasn't this moment, wasn't, wasn't the majority of Jesus' teaching to the Jewish people, and now this represented a, a change in which the Gentiles would be brought in. Is that basically it? There's a Samaritan uh, teaching, but even the Samaritan teaching, we have to understand that the, the teaching to the Samaritans is a little different than the teaching to Gentiles as a whole. The Samaritans were considered um, in the the family of the, the Jewish people, right? They were kind of this, this, this split off, right? Um, but they were actually considered worse than Gentiles because they should have known better, right? It's kind of like that, that, uh, that family member that, that should have known better but goes and you know, throws their life away sort of thing. That's how people saw the Samaritans. So you're right. This is a difference. Now we're talking about outside of the, the typical um, border of Judaism and what Jesus is seeing not, not that he wouldn't have already known this, but is that the expansion of the Old Testament promise is reaching the Gentiles, and it will continue. What is the primary, what's the primary reach of the, of the, the, new ch or of the church? Is the, the new, is the church, the followers of Jesus Christ, is our primary mission to uh, unbelieving Jewish people? Well, look around. How many Jewish people are in this room? You are all a product of the church. The church, worldwide, the primary mission is to the ends of the earth, the non-Jewish people. That doesn't mean the Jewish people are unimportant. Of course, they are very, very important. We don't have time to get into all that. 
But the primary mission of the church today is in our context, which is Gentile context. And so, yeah, there's this, this missional shift that's taking place. And when, G- when, Jesus, when Jesus commissions his followers at the end of Matthew's gospel, the beginning of, of Acts, the emphasis is on the borders beyond Judea. Judea is there. You shall be my witnesses where? In Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Okay, so that's so you're right. Jesus is seeing in that moment the mission is shifting. So Jesus says this hour is now come, and then he begins to offer up a prayer, a, a prayer of self-petition. He says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh, to give eternal life to all whom you have given. In verse, the second half of verse 1, and then he picks this up again in verse 5, which we'll talk a little bit more about when we get to that point. Jesus makes one request in this prayer. Now we know, we, we made the comparison with uh, the prayer in John, in John 17 and the prayer of the Garden of Gethsemane. What's the, what's the petition in the Garden of Gethsemane in the Synoptic Gospels? What's Jesus ask for? He asks, Lord, let this cup, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. And then he puts the, con- the statement, the conditional statement, the very important conditional statement, not my will, but your will be done. Here, Jesus makes one petition, and the petition is to glorify your son with the understanding that the son may glorify you. When J- Jesus, yeah, Nancy, yeah, we're getting there right now. We're getting there right this second. Um, what does glory mean? In, 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 in a, to a great degree, Jesus has been glorifying the Father. In fact, he talks about glorifying the Father throughout his mission. And he's glorified the Father in his continuous obedience to the will of the Father. He's glorified him, exhibiting that the Father is worthy to be followed, Exhibiting that the Father is, is, is worthy to be praised and, and devoted to. And demonstrating the importance of that all the way up to the cross. When Jesus asks, in some respects, when Jesus asks to be glorified, he's asking, first of all, I think, for the continuing, if this is a preparation prayer, for the continuing uh, will and passion to be obedient to the Father, even unto death, even death on a cross. That's, I think, at least a big part of it. Um, well, yeah, in some extent, Bruce said that's kind of like backing things up a little bit to focus on the son, I think, or for the son to focus on the father, the creator. I think part of it is to understand that this has always been the plan, okay? The cross is not plan B, okay? The cross is not plan B. It wasn't like uh, we threw a wrench into the whole system and God said, uh-oh, what are we going to do now? Uh, hey, hey, uh, son, um, here's the thing. I need you to go and sacrifice yourself to fix all this. Now, did we throw a wrench in the gears? We sinned, right? We did. We broke the world. We did. But is, was God surprised by that? No. Did God take that into account? Absolutely. Does God know, in fact, that we're going to do that? Yes. And in fact, to demonstrate something about his, not just justice, but also his mercy and grace, he sends his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross. Without the cross, without the forgiveness of sins, how would we know about the mercy of God? How would we understand about grace, unmerited, undeserved favor? We really wouldn't. Not in any kind of concrete way. Of course, grace and mercy is exhibited throughout creation but, uh, and throughout redemptive history, but it's, it's, it's elevated and it's culminated in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so Jesus prays, glorify the Son. Give the Son the ability to be exemplified. Now, that glory has another side, and we're going to talk about that in a second. When we, well, not probably not. Let's be honest. It'll be a week before we get to talk about it. But... Later on, he, he, he restates that, that request to glorify the Son. It's the same request, but also with, a, with a, a, a kind of a different focus. Now, 
he says, glorify the Son, that your Son, that the Son may glorify you. The basis for the glorification of God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, is always reciprocal. It's always the Father, Son, Holy Spirit in a perpetual state of glory and glorifying one another, loving and being loved. So I went, the, the, there used to be, a, people would ask the question, you know, why, why does God create? Why does God create? Um, and, and there used to be, and I, I think to some extent people still try to explain it this way, God wanted people to love. God needed people to love. That's wrong. That's bad theology. God is in perfect love in the Trinitarian relationship, but to exhibit that love, he creates. Robert, you had a question? You had a comment? It's a great question. So if you didn't hear Robert ask, it, do, we've, we see this father-son glory, but do we ever hear of, in the scriptures, the Holy Spirit um, being glorified? Off the top of my head, no, actually. Not in that explicit type of language. Now, we, we do read about if you look at the farewell discourse, the idea is that the Holy Spirit is sharing in the glory, but it's not explicit. It's more of an Im implied sort of sharing in the glory. Let me do some research on that, and let me get back to you, because that's a great question, and I don't have an answer for you. Um, yeah, Nancy. Yeah, that's... Yeah. Yeah, that... Yeah, yeah, that, that might... That, that would qualify. Though he doesn't use the glory language, so Nancy said, I, I know that I'm, I'm repeating for two reasons. One, because Nancy's way over here, Robert's over here, and there's people way over there, um, and I have a microphone and you don't. And the second reason is because we have people that, that watch online, but Nancy said uh, earlier in the farewell discourse, Jesus says, when I go away, one greater will come, and he's referring to the Holy Spirit. Would that not uh, qualify as an example of, and I think that's probably true. I think that's right. That's that's a good way to put it. He doesn't use the glory language there, but the again, it's implied that. Be, but again, what is the basis? What's the basis of the Son and the Father's glory? One another. What's the basis of the Spirit's glory in that context? It's what the Spirit does to point back to the Father and Son. So the glory is always a reciprocal glory. But let me let me do a little bit more research on that too. Yeah, Marcia. Yeah, so that, there's that reciprocal glory. So he's the, the Spirit glorifying the Son. How is the Spirit glorifying the Son? It receives the teaching that the Spirit will make known. I think it's not quite as explicit as we see here and, and in many other places in John's Gospel. I want to say the book of Acts talks about it, but I'm just not, I, I'll have to go back and look. But that's, a great, that's a great point. The idea, though, is that there is this reciprocal glorification relationship. Um, Jesus talks earlier in John 13 about, his, uh, about the glory uh, that he shares with the Father, but it's based on the service. How is the, so it's, it's upside, the glory that, God, or that Jesus is talking about, it always begins in this kind of upside down way. How is Jesus going to be glorified? Well, he's going to be crucified first. He's going to be humiliated. This is the most heinous, extreme act of execution, and yet that elicits glory from people, as well as the Father, from people who recognize the depth of their sin. Why do we go into church on Sunday and sing the hymns and sing the praise songs to Jesus Christ? It's not just because we have this you know, warm and fuzzy feeling about Jesus. It's because, one, we know the depth of our sin. And we know the cost that Jesus paid on our behalf at the cross. And we also know of the power of overcoming death that was exhibited in the empty tomb. And that's why Jesus asks for this glory, knowing that it will be given to him. Verse 2, he makes a point 
to say that the glory that he that the father gives to him and the fa- that, that he gives to the father um, is based on the authority that the father has given the son over what? Over all flesh. And then there's a little caveat to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. In verse 2, the basis for this request of glory and the promise of reciprocal glory is the authority that Jesus has been given. From all eternity, Jesus has authority over humanity. And it's based on the historical reality of his obedience at the cross. Okay? So let me just say that again because that, that's going to, if you really unpack what I just said, it's confusing. From all eternity, how long has Jesus had authority? The second person of the Trinity, Son of God, how long has he had authority over all flesh? Always. What is that authority based on? It's based on the historical, the temporal, at a moment in history, reality of Jesus being obedient to the Father's will unto death on a cross. Had Jesus not been obedient to death on a cross, the authority would have been null and void and actually never would have been given in the first place. Of course, that's, that's a, we start talking about those sorts of realities and philosophically it's absolutely impossible that that would take place because it would be a self-contradictory God. You can't have a self-contradictory God or it's no God at all. You get God, the gods of the, the Greek pantheon and the Egyptian pantheon and, and so on. But for an eternal and almighty and good God, there's no self-contradiction. And so from all eternity, the second person of the Trinity, Son of God, Jesus Christ, is given authority over all flesh to grant eternal life to those whom the Father has given him. The gift of eternal life from all eternity was contingent upon the work of Jesus from eternity past, but accomplished in a temporal fashion at Golgotha on the cross. You guys follow that? If you didn't, I, I don't blame you. It, it, it takes a little while to unpack it. But the authority that Jesus has given is the determination of Jesus' work. Now, there is no reality in which Jesus could have decided against obedience. At no point, there's no reality in which that could have taken place. Um... But hypothetically, obedience is not obedience without the possibility of disobedience. So this is where you start to really scramble your brain because you can't have a self-contradictory God. And yet at the same time, obedience really isn't obedience if it is compulsion without, uh, without an option, without a secondary option. So theoretically, Jesus could have said, you know what? I'm not, I'm not feeling so hot today. Let's push this whole cross thing a little later. Theoretically, that that may be possible, but it was not actual. It raises the question, just like Nancy raised the question, what is glory? It raises the question, what is eternal life? We've talked about this uh, many, many times as, as it's been presented in John's gospel many times. But from here, Jesus turns to this understanding of eternal life, a concept that has dominated John's narrative. If you read the famous passages of Scripture, John 3, 15 and 16, John 3, 36, John 4, 36, John 5, 24, John 5, 39, John 6, 27, 6, 40, 6, 47, 6, 54, 6, 68, 10, 28, 12, 25, and 12, 50, and that's not even the end of the book. He's talked a lot about eternal life. What is it? As we pointed out in our discussion on, Jesus, on John's uh, presentation of Jesus' identity at various points, the difference between faith and unbelief is acceptance of Jesus. But it's not just acceptance of just this kind of concept of Jesus. It's based on the concept of, of, of Jesus at, as who he says he is. Jesus is an actual, has an actual identity, not one that can be ev- invented. And it's based on the relationship and the knowledge of the true nature of God. So the Old Testament um, elevates 
this, the importance of knowledge of the one true God. And if you look at John 17 for a second, you continue on to verse 3. This is what he says. He says, uh, to give eternal life to whom you've given, and this is eternal life. This is eternal life. He's giving an answer to the question, what is it? That they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. This is a direct tie to the Old Testament understanding of a true knowledge of God and eternal life. So let's open up, for example, uh, to, to an Old Testament passage um, in Jeremiah. I'm going to go to Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah 31, verse 34. The prophet is projecting out into a reality in which the kingdom will come. And he says, And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each brother saying, Know thy Lord. Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the, de the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sins no more. So the idea is that knowledge of God le leads to true acceptance of God. Leads to this eternal life and forgiveness of sins that is promised. We get the same sort of... Uh, kind of idea in Hosea chapter 4 verse 6 where the culmination of the redeemed earth will be an entire planet that is full of the knowledge of the Lord. We get the same sort of thing in Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 14. So again, we don't often think of eternal life as equated with knowledge, but it makes sense, doesn't it? And, and, and what's the difference? What is true knowledge? Okay, there's an understanding and acceptance. And what else? So my son is, is learning, what's that? Belief. So my son is learning um, multiplication tables right now. He's very excited because he memorized all of his multiplication tables through 12. It was a big deal in our house. Um, now, if he memorizes those multiplication tables, he has a certain level of knowledge. But when does that knowledge matter to him? When will it actually make a difference in his life? When A, he's testing on it, probably the first thing, and B, most importantly, when he can sit at a table and he can actually figure out uh, how to how to balance his, his bank account based on multiplication and division and subtraction and, and addition. When he can actually do something with it in regular life. Right? So when does, not, when does the intellectual part turn into reality? When does it turn into true knowledge? When it leads to a changed action. Right? When it turns into... So how does true knowledge lead to eternal life? When someone can look at, at, the, at, at, at knowing who God is... Not merely an intellectual assent to say, well, I know that I look at the universe and I think obviously someone created all this. That's great. But if it doesn't cause you to bow down and worship that God, then it's not true knowledge. It's just, oh, explaining how the world works. It may not change how you live your life. There are a lot of people that believe in a God. There are a ton of people that look at the universe and say, I don't, I don't necessarily believe in the Christian God. I don't necessarily believe in the Muslim God. I don't necessarily believe in... The, the, the God of, of Judaism, but I believe that there is some sort of, you know, intellectual designer. Or I believe in my God, or as the Enlightenment, the Enlightenment believed in the divine watchmaker, right? They, they said, well, obviously, if you look at the universe, it's too beautiful, it's too glorious, it's too meticulous. There has to be a God, but he doesn't care about what you do. He wound up the clock, we don't wind clocks anymore. But he wound up the clock and he let it go. And he doesn't do anything with it. And eventually it's going to run out. But he's done what he's going to do. Does that knowledge lead to any kind of difference in life change? Maybe slightly, but it doesn't tell you anything about, you know, 
what you ought to do and what you ought not to do. It doesn't tell you anything about grace and mercy and love. And so it's really not true knowledge. It's even almost worse than false knowledge. It's kind of partial knowledge. True knowledge of God leads to eternal life because it leads to the understanding that there is a creator God, there is a wonderful plan, there is a a, a standard, and I don't measure up to it. And the only way that I can be right with this one true awesome and mighty God is to submit to him, and if he will then kind of condescend down to me and save me. And that's what he's done through Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus says knowledge of God and Jesus Christ, who is also God, whom God has sent. That's what leads to really and true eternal life and transformation. We're going to stop right there because we're going to get back into the glory piece uh, next week. Um, but uh, just uh, just real quick, we uh, we've got Kirk and the Tartans at the ten thirty service in Classic, and we've got presentation of third grade Bible. This is one reason I have to shut us down a couple minutes early because my son is getting his third grade Bible. I'm pretty excited about that, so I got to go meet them and get all ready in the narthex. And I'm not even really sure what we're doing, but it's going to be fun. And then obviously fall festival afterwards. Let's pray, Lord God. We thank you and praise you that you are the one true God and that true knowledge of you is the only thing that leads to eternal life. Help us, Lord. Help us to not just know in our minds of your goodness and your love and your mercy, but to have it make a difference in us so that our knowledge is true and sure. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Have a good one.